Chapter 5, August 8th through 10th, Hope. August 8th through 10th, Above Camp, Hope. That was the impossible, nearly invisible thread linking Urzua's men trapped below and their anxious families above. I know it may sound hard to believe, said Pedro Contreras, the uncle of one of the miners, but we can't lose hope. By the time the sun had burned off the night cold, some 300 people had collected at the mine site, a mix of family, friends, fellow miners, engineers, experts, and government ministers. Jose Vega, the 70-year-old miner who had warned his son Richard not to keep working at San Jose, dashed to the mine as soon as he heard of the collapse. I'm not the kind of person to sit there with my arms crossed and crying, he told the reporter. My son needs my help, and I'm going after him. Vega was there to help and not just wait. He'd brought another son and four others. If no one else could save the men below, he was going to hack at the rocks himself. The restless miners and their families were determined to stay until their relatives came back, alive or dead. A bonfire was fine for one night, but not for a vigil that could last a week or more. A tent city started to grow near the mine. But hope was like a dancing wind. One moment the campsite brought people together, helping one another. The next someone started sobbing, another yelling, and the hillside was a cauldron of angry emotions about to boil over. Minister Goldborn needed to keep one eye on the rescue efforts and another on the needs and moods of the community, which now also included a growing set of news reporters serving as the eyes and ears of the, wander of the watching world. He had nothing good to tell the press. We've gone from hours to days, and now possibly a rescue that could take weeks, he announced on Monday the 9th. Then, speaking for himself, but also clearly for the relatives, he added that it is very painful for us and generates a feeling of anger and powerlessness. The media now had two stories to cover, the rescue effort and the rising tide to, of blame. Who was at fault? Why had men been sent into an unsafe mine? Why were there no escape routes? Who let, the, his, who let this happen? August 10th, above prayer. St. Lawrence is the patron saint of mining in Chile, and this was his day. The Chileans called the entire effort to save the men Operacion San Lorenzo, the St. Lawrence mission. Faith can be seen as a stronger version of hope. It is hope plus hope and belief, hope and trust. The Catholic bishop, Caspar, Caspar Quintana, held a mass on the site on the saint's day. The statue of the Virgin of Cal Calderia, the focus of the shrine and two celebrations in Copiapo, was brought to San Jose. Bishop Quintana promised it would remain there as long as the rescue continued. Along the hillside would be filled with shrines, statues, and posters of religious figures. Later, 33 flags, 32 of Chile, one for Bolivia, for Carlos Mamini, the one foreign miner, would flap bravely in the wind nearby. It was as if the deep feelings of the relatives needed to come out to be visible. They could not stay inside. The statues and flags were like electrical towers, a way for people to beam their yearnings down into the black earth and up into the silent sky. Most people in Chile are Catholic, and the presence of the bishop and the statues must have fed their hope and their faith. But the bishop was not the only religious leader on the site. Carlos Parra Diaz, a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, soon arrived, offering counsel and prayer. He was later joined by Marcelo Lieva, a Baptist pastor, and Javier Soto, an evangelical minister. Whatever rivalry there may have been between the religious groups, they were serving the same end, offering comfort when no one else seemed to have any to offer. For a while, the men and machines trying to dig down to the miners were feeling optimistic. They estimated they were about 900 feet away, but heading in the right direction. Good progress. But they soon realized they were not actually following the path down that they mapped out. At best, they were about 40 feet off from where they wanted to be. Their calculations might have been off, but the layout of the mine also kept changing. The situation is very complex, President Piera said. The mine continues to have collapses. Nothing the engineers had tried was working or was likely to work. This is not easy, the president admitted. The situation is now not only in our hands, but also in the hands of God. Was there no hope? The families in the camp, the miners' wives, children, nieces, nephews, grandchildren, and friends, were now all the more alone. Their husbands, fathers, uncles, grandfathers, heroes, for one of the trapped miners was Franklin Lobos, a one-time soccer star and local favorite, were being left entombed. Above, drill. Fidel Bayes is an extremely experienced manager at Codoloco. While emotions rose and fell at the mine, Bayes was slowly and carefully reading, thinking, and planning for it was his job to sort through all of the offers of help that had been coming to Chile and to select the best possible strategy for saving the men. 
Baez was certain the miners were alive and could be rescued. The question was, how? If there was no way to reopen the mine and go down, what else could they do? As Baez laid out all of the emails that had come in, he saw the answers, nine of them. There were at least nine drills that could be brought to San Jose. The drills could go down to the earth, even if the ground kept shifting. It would be like ice fish fishing, but instead of aiming through ice for fish, they were going down through layers of stone to find life. They would keep drilling down until they got through the solid rock and reached the shelter. If the miners were alive, that is where they had to be. Kelvin Brown is an expert at guiding the very sophisticated drills made by Reflex Instruments, where he was an executive. The only problem was the company, Brown, and the equipment were in Australia. On August 15th, a military airplane dropped Brown and his drill off in Copiapo. Below, what do you see underground? When you turn off the lights in an underground mine, Dr. Chavez explains, if you open your eyes wide and stare, you seem to see wavy lines, like heat in the darkness. Ron Mishkin agrees. In the pitch black, you see colored lights. There you are, in thick blackness, seeing strange sights. And then something goes wrong. You slip where you shouldn't have slipped, or rock falls where you were sure there were no loose rocks. You know you are far away from the land of kids and trees and homes and friendly faces. It is very easy to believe you are in someone else's kingdom, the land of a spirit you need to win over, or pay off, or distract. There are many legends about the nasty creatures that live in the depths of mines. In Germany, mischievous mime spirits were called kobolds. The element cobalt, as in cobalt blue, owes its name to the mythical creatures because it gives off noxious fumes when burned, as if a sprite were punishing you for touching it. In Cornwall, England, one of the oldest areas of tin mining in the world, it was believed that little hideous demons lived in the tin and copper mines and hated miners. If miners heard knocking on the rock walls, they knew they'd better start running because a cave-in was about to start. To this day, these demons are known as Tommy Knockers. They are similar legends throughout South America. The miners in Potsky kiss a devil figure as they descend into the earth. Miners in Peru respect a gnome-like figure. And Dr. Chavez heard a tale in Chile of a female spirit that insisted that no women or priests enter the mine. Hell is often pictured as a place of fire deep within the earth, and these, that association of earth, evil, and other realm inhabited by weird creatures exists in many parts of the world. Perhaps we always feel we are stealing from the earth when we descend up, down into it to find us treasures. If we are like thieves, we must be entering the realm of dark creatures. Or maybe it is because light and air are so important to us. They sp speak of spring, summer, and growth. So, to go down away from the sun into the earth is to enter another kingdom. But underground is not always linked with sp sprites, gnomes, and devils. It can also be a place where a person's spirit is tested. The ancient Egyptians believed that death, after death, a person's fate was decided in a ceremony held deep underground in the kingdom of the god Osiris. The dead heart was weighed against truth, which was as light as a feather. Greek myths tell of Hercules and Orpheus entering Hades. Some scholars believe those stories are the outlines of actual rituals where Greeks entered caves and had to pass tests in order to be in initiated into special cults. For the ancient Greeks, going down into the darkness of a cave gave you the chance to look inside yourself. The very darkness removed distractions and allowed you to look fiercely into an inner mirror. So rather than being the home of alien evil beings, the cave was the testing place where you could examine yourself like a Native American on a vision quest. In those first moments of swirling dust, Franklin Lobos, the former soccer star turned miner, could have been separated from the other men. But he thought he saw something like a white butterfly leading him back to the shelter. He was not a religious man, but he began to believe. In the silence and dark, other men were looking at their lives, at bad choices they had made, people they had hurt. It was as, as if they were all Jonah, swallowed up inside a whale and wondering, why? What have I done? What could I do better from now on? Mario Gomez, the oldest of the trapped men, took a place alongside Sepulia and Urzua. Sepulia was the energetic cheerleader. Urzua was their captain, their planner, the man who guided their actions. But Gomez now became their priest, their healer, who could nurse their faith. Drilling gave the rescue workers above ground a new focus, but it felt very different down in the mine. The rescue effort was the most agonizing tease. Lobos would hear the grinding up above, shaking the rocks below. When the noise sounded close, his spirits rose. He felt alive. But each time the drill pulled away, the noise fading to silence. He began to pray as he had never done before. But there was something else down in the mine that linked him back to his old life. Urzua had been a soccer coach, and the men in the mine were were becoming a kind of team. 
the really great teams, Lobo said later, are the really bonded ones. I didn't know many of the people I was working with when we were trapped, but when it happened, we pulled together. The tiny bit of food they shared held them together. Urzua was a map maker, and he was planning. He divided the men into groups, each with its own task. The trucks down in the mines could not drive the men out, but Urzua knew they could be useful in other ways, so one group of men was assigned to keep them in running order. Edison Pena rigged together enough lamps and generators and truck engines to fend off the dark and provide a glow of light. Another group carefully watched over and divided up the food. Gomez was a spiritual leader, and Yanni Barrios, who had been a bit of a med who had a bit of medical training years earlier, was the doctor. Everyone was occupied. They had a goal, a purpose. No one was permitted to go off alone for very long. We worked hard for our own rescue, Urzuo explained. Every light Pena turned on and every chore that each team completed tied them together and gave them hope.